Now that we have returned from the feast overall, it's important that we begin looking ahead, which is what this sermon is entitled today, Looking Ahead, Part 1. To begin looking ahead in the manner that we're going to be covering here and the focus we're to have, we're going to start by taking a good look at this year's feast. So we're going to look back a little bit and review some of the things that uh, we started out with at the feast and then build upon that as we move forward. So from the very first day, we looked at what God tells us we are to be doing every feast of tabernacles, and that is to rejoice. And that's an awesome thing, and this was indeed for me uh, an awesome feast, primarily because of the church, the brethren. And I'll just mention it up front. I'm going to get to it eventually anyway here. I wanted to bring it in, but I'll do it in the beginning here. To me, one of the greatest things was that in the beginning, we, we had a few little things. They're very little, very small. And uh, I think of the establishment and learning to roll with the punches and what we said we were going to do. We're going to make it work. Anyway, uh, after we got past the meal, <laughs> <laughs> that was the thing I was the most concerned about, especially the special meals, because they were coming out late, and it's like, ah. But, uh, you know, we just roll with the punches, and if we don't all get food, then that's life. <laughs> there are places to go get it afterwards. But anyway, it went very well, and the few incidents that were there, I thought I'd just mention that it was really refreshing seeing how quickly individuals responded. Uh, human nature is human nature. We all have it. And as a whole, there was that attitude and spirit of wanting to make things right or to, in essence, say, I'm sorry, whatever it might be. And that's always a good thing when it happens that way, when an individual has a desire to make things right, to do things right. And in times past, that hasn't always been the case where people are willing to change when they receive correction or whatever it might be. So again, that to me was a very rewarding thing, a very, very rewarding thing. It was encouraging to see that in people. And the main thing was, is everybody got along so exceptionally well and things went so smoothly as the farther we got into the feast, people were just awesome. It was a very rewarding time to be with people and see the different kinds of activities and what we were able to do together and constantly bumping into one another. And uh, anyway, I'll probably come back to some of those as we go along, but very inspiring, very exciting to see those things done. And it shows growth, it shows growth in the body. And what can I say? That's a rewarding thing. And it's something you rejoice in then. It's something that causes you to be thankful if you're thankful when you see the fruit of the different things that are taking place, then that's a part of this process of rejoicing, just as was brought out. Leviticus 23, let's go back and take a look at it. Leviticus 23. Again, also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land. And again, what an incredible thing here when you go back and you see little things here and there, but uh, physical for them. Um, for us, we see physical things and spiritual things that we're to grasp and comprehend. They only saw that which, in essence, was physical. You shall keep a feast unto the eternal seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. Even you shall take to yourselves of the first day boughs of good trees. So I think of this word here right away, fruit. It's a word for fruit. What? What a crazy thing that so many things have been so twisted in Scripture and just the fact that, that this can be found 118 times translated properly and then here they, they do this. You think, what are they drinking? You know, I don't know. Anyway. And then branches or hands of palms, of palm trees and branches of thick trees and willows and you shall rejoice before the eternal your God. So... We're commanded to do that, but again, what we focused upon the, at the feast this year was to understand how you're able to rejoice in spirit and in truth. And it always comes down to how thankful we are and if we're really thanking God for the things that He gives to us, if we see them, if we think about them. So a part of the reason for going into this and looking ahead is that this is something we should be striving to grow in, to draw closer to God in, and in order to accomplish that, 
we have to practice this more in our own lives of looking at the various things, not just having attended the feast now, but thinking about what we experienced and why we experienced and what the, some of the highlights were that inspired us and encouraged us more. Because it's one thing to go out and do physical things. I think of the bull riding, <laughs> the mechanical bull, uh, had to try that. And uh, I couldn't even hardly get up on top of the thing. <laughs> I have short legs and this thing is up here somewhere and I've got to, you've got to jump up there and get on. They don't have stirrups on a bull. I mean, what would that be? <laughs> I mean, it'd be docile if they had stirrups and a thing around them. So, uh, of course, this is a mechanical bull. It's not real. <laughs> so I couldn't get up there the first time. And then the second time, it came to me. <laughs> this uh, rubber thing you fall down into, with ha it has air inside of it. I don't know. They have a machine in there that keeps uh, this, this thing inflated uh, on the sides and at the bottom. So I started jumping up and down. It's probably about this thick. And it has air inside of it. So I started jumping up and down. And then I knew that when I got to the top that I could feel it. That's when you want to jump. It worked. I still struggled, but I got up there. <laughs> but everybody had a ball, young and old alike. Incredible, different ones that tried it. And um, just the ability to be out there and, and again, the rewarding part for me was seeing the joy in people, the excitement in people, the hollering that was going on and the cheering, and sometimes cheering when they went off. <laughs> yes! So all those things were enjoyable, and it, there are things like that you share together that draw us closer together as a family. We experience things together. We're able to share things together, and those are rewarding. And so. To see all this take place, to be a part of that, and constantly bumping into some, maybe not spending very much time with each other as you bump into each other because everyone's doing different things, and you can't all be together, although there were some places to eat there that did have some long tables that people could take their food out to it or whatever, and, but again, very rewarding, some of these things. Um, I think of the uh, go-kart track area, or whatever that thing is called, the carts. and. The laser tag, never done those things before like that, especially those carts of that type. And I had a ball, <laughs> had a ball with the individuals there, even some of the smack talk <laughs> that takes place when you, when you do those things. I don't know if you had that expression. They may not have that in Australia, New Zealand, Europe. But uh, smack talk is, is uh, you're giving people a hard time and you're going to beat them. <sighs> or whatever it might be, and when you do poorly, we make fun of that. <laughs> it's, it's just about a good time and having fun back and forth. And so we challenged one another, just like in the laser tag. I think we had 20 some, 24 people in there at one time, something like that, in the church. And uh, you have these vests you wear, different colors, two different teams, and, and Gabe. <laughs> He got first in that group as far as the highest points. I thought, How, where, you've been practicing this week after week or what? <laughs> but again, a lot of fun, things you remember, things you hold on to, and a closeness there that you're able to share. What an awesome thing to be thankful for that. And then when you see God in the picture, he's made it all possible. Isn't that an awesome thing? God Almighty has given us an opportunity to be together on holy days or different places that we are, and a, a Feast of Tabernacles, if you will, ever who came together there. It's awesome. It really is. And God made it possible. And so the more thankful we are for the opportunities that God gives to us, that's something that can live within, within you in a, on a spiritual plane. And there's a thankfulness and a gratitude, but we have to thank God, too. So think about some of those things. What do you have to be thankful for? One night, wasn't sleeping quite as well. I'm not sure why. Maybe it was the bull. I don't know. But anyway, uh, started thinking about all the things that we were doing together at the feast, all the activities that were taking place, all the opportunities for fellowship that we had. And even though we might not be able to have as much in some cases because of people who had allergies like myself or that, the fact that Big deal if I had to go someplace else in order to film everything or to have it live on YouTube. Everybody had the chance and the opportunity, obviously, to see it. 
and being able to fellowship before or after, maybe not quite as much, but we still were able to fellowship a lot. And so you make the most of some bad situations sometimes. And that's, there are lessons in all that. You just keep plugging forward and things work out and we're blessed. Not everything is smooth in life. Not everything is obviously smooth at the feast. <laughs> but where they're rough and places and you just push forward, especially with one another. And an attitude of mind, we are more willing or more observant at a time like that to watch our own attitudes because we want others to have a good feast as well. So anyway, it just goes on and on and on. And I started thinking about all the situations there that God made possible. And the more you think about them, because you have to think about them, the opportunities that God gave us, and the, and the more thankful you are inside, how can you give that to someone, a rejoicing? Because it's about rejoicing in God and what God gives us. And it's on, a, it's on a spiritual plane in that regards. It's one thing to have it physically, but it's another thing to have it in a, the relationships we have with one another that draw us closer together. So again, it was stated at the feast that indeed we're to be filled with excitement. That's a great time to be able to be filled with excitement. I mean, God gives us this opportunity to come together. We save for it. You save for it throughout the year. And you save aside that amount. And then God says, come here and enjoy yourself. What an incredible plan to do various things that maybe you can't do during the rest of the year, or especially not with people in the church on a large scale. And here we're able to do it on a larger scale as a whole for those who were able to attend. So again, things that we can do at the feast that God has provided for us, a thankfulness, a gratefulness. So if it's genuine and real inside, there's a, there's a thinking toward God that does cause a rejoicing inside. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 17, Luke 17. So as we begin this series, it's good to reflect on what we had to be thankful for that in turn helped us to rejoice. When you think about those things and think about the times that you felt better at the feast because of something you were able to do with others, and you see God in the picture for what God provided and gave the opportunity for those things because everyone is there because God has called them. What an incredible thing. God has called us to be together as a family. And because people are striving to change, that's why I mentioned what I did at the very beginning. What an awesome thing that year by year we're growing if we're yielding ourselves to God. And I, I feel that's what I saw the most of this year. The problems that were there, the things that were mentioned a couple times in sermons, they were so small compared to times and feasts before going back in time. Very minor in that respect. And where there were things that needed to be corrected, the response was great. Because I haven't always seen that. But here, what an awesome thing to see people yielding themselves to God. And as people do that, as God's people do that, we're able to draw closer together, be more at one, and recognize we have a family. We have a uniqueness of a spiritual family that God has made possible. And because of the growth of individuals who are yielding themselves to God, receiving what they do, and making that spiritual growth, we become a stronger body. <laughs> That's an incredible thing to experience when you think about it in those terms. We're closer, we're a stronger body, we become a stronger family. The ability to deal with problems and difficulties together, what an awesome thing. And, and when you think about the Feast of Tabernacles, then you think, make that thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands times bigger as people change and grow through the millennium. What we're going to have as a world, as a society, and the rejoicing that people are going to be able to have in, a, in something that's real and something that's true. The world, people do things together, but it's not the same. People are able to have friends and so forth, but it's not the same. When you're bound by God's spirit, <clears throat> because you're striving to grow in the uni unity and oneness, and we have all this in common, there's a greater strength and power in that that comes from God Almighty. He wants to rejoice in us. 
And it's a spiritual thing because as he dwells in us, as he and Joshua dwell in us, and that life is able to go out to others and then be received back and God receives it, how do you describe that? Except that you live it and experience it and realize this is, this is what life is about. There's a richness and an excitement and a joy in life, a peace that the world doesn't have. And so we yearn for that, we long for that, for the world, for families, for people. Luke chapter 17. Now it came to pass, and we've looked at this before when we talked about thankfulness a couple of years ago or three years ago, whatever it was now. But I'm going to add a little bit more to it this time. Now it came to pass that as he, speaking of Joshua, went to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. <clears throat> then as he entered a certain village, and there met him ten men who were lepers, who were keeping their distance. And they raised up their voices and said, Joshua, master or teacher, have mercy on us. So when he saw them, he said to them, go, show yourselves to the priests. So it was that as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice glorified God. Now, reading this today with what we have talked about, about rejoicing at the feast and keeping that command that God gave to us, it's far more inclusive when we understand what God is telling us. This is how we're supposed to be because of what's living inside of us on a spiritual plane. We should be able to rejoice if we have that mind. And this is a beginning of it, of seeing some of this, what it's about. It's thankfulness. He was exceedingly thankful for what had happened to him. And giving that thanks to the right source. So it says he glorified God. Well, how did he do that? How did he glorify God? He was honoring God because he was acknowledging that God had done this. And because of that and what was inside of him because of what he was experiencing, he couldn't help himself in that respect. That gratitude was so deep inside of him that it came out in what he was saying and what he was doing. He was reflecting the fact that he was doing this in a way that should be done, period. When it comes down to having thankfulness to God and we respond to God, there's a glorifying God. That's, that should be automatic. We glorify God by obeying God. We glorify God by that way of life and we want it to be in us and to live within us and we cry out for it for help to change so that the more we live this way of life that God gives to us, truly the more we glorify God in how we live and what we do and how we think toward one another. That's what glorifies God. It's not a matter just of words. It's not a matter of just being on our knees and crying out to God and thanking God. That's all a part of it, but it has to be inside what we're experiencing. And that's what God desires to see. So what he was doing or in this was he was rejoicing. Wouldn't you rejoice if you had been a leper? I, sometimes it's hard to think about individuals and what they were living, but they were always, you know, they used to have islands or places uh, where people that were lepers were kept because no one wanted to catch it. No one else wanted it. And so it had a unique term in that respect. You're leprous. You're a leper. That went synonymous with keeping away. You know, keep away from us. Don't be around us. And so they kept their distance. As it says in this example, they had their distance, but they were crying out because they understood how people felt and they grasped that to a point. But it's something that they couldn't do. They couldn't go and be close to individuals in close contact with individuals, no hugging, you know, no shaking hands, nothing of that type whatsoever. They had to keep a distance and they understood this. 
And they had to, and what a horrible thing to have to live your life like that to know. And, and if you knew what it looked like, it, it was ugly. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of people who had leprosy, but it's ugly. And the worse it is on the body, the uglier it is. So when you don't have that anymore, you would think that everyone would rejoice. But his rejoicing was based on what was inside of him, which was thankfulness. He was so thankful to God, so thankful that Joshua was there and said what he did to them. Incredible. So this is a very physical example of something we do in our lives regularly, thanking God. And the more we can thank God, because if it's genuine and we truly believe it with all of our being, it reflects something in the mind. It reflects truth. It reflects agreement. It reflects we acknowledge God Almighty, that we see that God Almighty gave this. And there is that emotion and that feeling and that sense of thanking God from the deepest part of our being for what we have. Because we see it, we believe it, and we love it, and we want it more. We desire that unity and oneness with one another without problems, without drama. We don't want drama. The more you grow, the more you learn to hate drama. And you don't want to have drama with others, so you want to make peace, you want to be a peacemaker, you want to engage in the things that we've been told to do, instructed to do, of how to live life together as a family. And then the family grows and grows greater and greater without drama, peace. It's a beautiful thing to where you can do those things, going out together and doing things together and, and someone being on a bull and, and you're, you're waiting to the time they fly off. And you can say, yes, you know, and kind of have a little smack talk there back and forth or whatever, you know, and, and goad them a little bit <laughs> because you're close. Those that I do that with, I'm closer to because I know they'll do it back. Not disrespectfully, not in a wrong way, not with wrong feelings, but because we're close, we're friends. And we can do this back and forth and have fun with one another, enjoy one another without being offended. Sometimes people can't do things without being offended at something that someone else says. And the reality is it comes to a point, the closer we are and the more we grow in those things, we don't take offense at someone and what they might have said. Realize, well, maybe they had a bad day. Maybe they're having a tough day and said something a little more curt or to the point in a way that, but you shut, you just, I've had days like that, you have days like that, so hey, things happen sometimes. <laughs> and you're willing to be of a forgiving spirit and a forgiving attitude, and it draws you closer together because you're lo you learn to love them more. To me, that's something awesome to pray about on a regular basis. Help me to love God, your people more. So if we do that with one another, and we're asking God for help in that, then there are things we're going to be able to catch more quickly when we start to say something that's wrong. And maybe it still comes out, but later on, the more we're on guard to some of those things, the better it gets. The more beautiful it is. The friendships, relationships, the closeness. Verse 15. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned, and with a loud voice, glorify God. He couldn't hold it in. You think, and the contrast here is amazing. What about the rest of them? I mean, that really is mind-boggling, what mankind is like. <sighs> what a horrible thing to not be thankful, but to be exceedingly selfish, not to thank God for the things we have, just to be on the getting end of something, take something and do it selfishly so. Horrible. And so that's a contrast. But this individual with a loud voice, he didn't care, you know, with a loud voice, glorify God. And fell down on his face at his feet, speaking of what it's saying here, giving him thanks. And even he was a Samaritan. A foreigner. And yet, this was something that he recognized, and he knew who it came from in the sense of 
what had been going around and what had been talked around amongst people for so long there. It was, it was throughout the whole country, things that he was doing. And then when he came, they came by, he came by, that's why they went to him because they'd already heard these stories of healings and so forth. And it's like, I want to be there when he comes by. And then when it happened and they were healed, just one. One really followed through and acknowledged God. Now, in some ways, we're not a whole lot different sometimes as we grow. And keeping God in the picture, everything we have in, in the body of Christ, everything we have in the environment of the church of God, God's made possible. There should always be a thankfulness for various things that we are able to experience and have with one another. Thank you, God. God gives the calling. And, and that kind of a mind, too, helps us to understand that we better be very careful in those relationships because every person belongs to God, God's servant, God's child, God's begotten child. And we have to be, if we see those things and believe those things with all of our being and our mind, we're going to be more careful what comes out of here and what we say because it really is toward God. It's about God. If we don't see God in the picture, then it's just a church in the world. That's all it is. And we've had those kinds of things happen within the church where we haven't been as far in our growth, but the farther we go along, the more God is giving, the more refined we're becoming, the more he's cleansing the body individually as we cry out for it and within the entire body, the stronger the body's becoming. <laughs> It's what I saw at the feast. Beautiful. Can't help but get emotional. Because God made it possible. This closeness that we're able to have within the body. To see people who were genuinely excited about being with one another. The sound. You know, it's generally that way at all the feasts. <laughs> but you think, God's creating. We had a sermon about this before the feast. God is creating peace. And he's doing it within everyone who's yielding themselves to him. And it's within the entire body, not just within one or two. It's within the body for all who want that, for all who are yielding themselves to that. And that's what I saw in a magnified way at this feast above other feasts, which to me, I don't want it to be a saying that we just say it or feel like we have to say it, but it really was for me the best feast that I've ever experienced in God's church because of that on a spiritual plane. Little ripples, small, in the scheme of things, really, really small things that took place that were so minute and so minor. That, that in itself was refreshing because it's accomplished by individuals striving to be on guard themselves, striving to do what is right, having grown in the past year, able to produce more fruit in their lives. And the more that happens as a body, the more awesome it becomes. It gives us a bit, of, a bit more taste, if you will, of Elohim, because that's going to be multiplied so many times over once we're there that we really can't grasp it, but we get a taste of it every once in a while. And I had a great taste of it at the feast this year, Elohim. We, it, it's far beyond that, but we have a taste of it. It's like Agape, God's love. We don't have it all the time. And we experience it or we live it to varying degrees, depending on where we are in that particular day and how much, how much we've worked ourselves and drawing close to God and crying out for God for his help and his spirit. And but still there's this carnality that's selfish, and we have that battle that goes on. But what a beautiful thing is we're learning to conquer so much of that and becoming more at one with one another. It's a beautiful thing, it truly is. So even that should help us to have a greater excitement about what's coming, about what God is doing, the millennium. I think of Herbert Armstrong talking about it's gonna take three or four generations to get things to where they're leveled to a point where they should be in that new age. Because we take a lot of baggage, people are gonna bring a lot of baggage out of the world, the past and various things they've gone through. And, and it's easy to pass those things down then from generation to generation. The children pick them up and to understand that all you have to do is look at the religions of the world or the places of skirmishes and problems in the world where people have 
wrong judgments towards others, sometimes because of race or because of a different nationality or, or because of occupation or, or whatever it is and this haughtiness that sometimes, and, and these things get passed or the way people have been treated and then it's passed on to the children and children's children. That's the hard part. And that's why Herbert Armstrong made the comment, it's gonna take three or four generations to really work through some of those things to begin really getting rid of a lot of that, of the things that are wrong. And then to recognize what we can have. So I look back, as you think about look, sitting on a booth, <laughs> I think of looking back to Philadelphia and the, the growth pattern that was there, what we had and what we didn't have, because we didn't know what we didn't have fully in that regard until we got to here and all the truths that God has given to us and the refinement that God is giving and the cleaning of the body that God is doing because it's different and it's all about a process of cleansing the body and preparing it for Christ's coming in a very unique way and preparing it for those who are going to live on into a physical life, continuing on in their lives and those who are going to be a part of 144,000. That's awesome. And so we're going through this process of how God is working with us in those things. And it's exciting. And the more we grow and the closer we get to that, the more exciting it, get, it becomes. That's why I love how God has blessed us with a small body and purposed it so. Not by might, not by power, not by what we do. And God's making that very clear when it's all said and done and all those who are part of the scattered body and all those who are able to come into and understand things in the millennium and all those who are resurrected later on who were part of the church or whatever it might be and they're going to look back and, and realize this is what God did and he did it with such a small group and he, he revealed powerfully so that he did it. That he's the one who accomplished it. If we had a church the size of worldwide we'd be looking to ourselves and look what we're able to accomplish and look at what we, God doesn't want the slightest little bit of that in us. And so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> it's, it's hard as we try in some things. It's like spinning your wheels because it's something that God is going to accomplish in his time and how he does it. And so we do what we can while we can and so forth. I hope you understand what I'm saying. It's just like understanding that we had all these ministers. I'm just going to look at the United States. Hundreds and hundreds of ministers throughout the United States. And what happened? Well, in time, it's what happened in the angelic realm. God allowed it to happen in the church. We're to learn from that. And if there's not a strong way on human beings to have a, how can I say this, a strong control, things are going to get out of hand. Why? lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And as Herbert Armstrong got older, those things came more and more to the surface. As he was getting closer to death, those things came more and more to the surface. And leaders in the church began to get wrong thinking in their minds. Who's going to be taking his place? Who should we back? Or perhaps it's me. And you think horrifying things that took place. And as time went on, there were different ones out here beginning to teach their own things. Why? Because there were no controls. God knew what was going on. Headquarters didn't. There, was, there wasn't a means to do that. So God allowed to happen within the church what happened in the angelic realm. Except what happened within church in that regard, we have to be able to see the heinousness of it because we're talking about people begotten of God's Holy Spirit. Begotten of God's Spirit in the mind. And that stuff should have never, never happened. But somewhere along the line, it began to happen and God gave the time. Lucifer had a lot of time and then finally it happened. And the church had a lot of time then Herbert Armstrong died. Look what happened. It didn't take long. When you look at the timing of it, it really didn't take that long. And it just shows being in this body, a body, and having the begettle of God's Spirit 
doesn't guarantee anything except that God has told us that the road is there. It's easy if you do what is right. It's all there. But if you don't, and that's the problem, because of carnality, because of human nature and so forth, that mankind cannot be entrusted with God's way for a long time. Not for long periods of time. That's just the way it is. Unless God give the ability or the things taking place within the body. He could have prevented, he could have prevented the apostasy. But it wasn't God's purpose. Do we grasp those? It's like what we talked about at the feast. Do we see how God does the things He does and the way He does and why? Do we grasp indeed deeply why the angelic realm was made as it was, being spirit, but yet able to, when it came to a point of accepting things that were different from God, it was said immediately? And why we had, what, a, what an incredible miracle to understand that we're in a human body that can be impregnated with God's spirit, but by choice, this mind that has a spirit essence in it it can be transformed. It can be reprogrammed by choice. I want to be different. I don't want carnal, selfish human nature. I don't choose that way. I reject it. I want what God has. And then to fight for it. What an, what an amazing thing. God, God knows how to create Elohim. <laughs> and he's giving us a chance to be part of it. But we have to go through this to get there. And so we had to experience what happened in, later in Worldwide when Herbert Armstrong died. And we had to come up to a time of an apostasy to experience that, to see what human beings can do. Because one of the things that Herbert Armstrong stressed so powerfully so that rings in my mind, God can trust no one but God. He made that point over and over again. No one can be fully trusted because, unless they're a matter of being God. We have to be able to become Elohim, to be out of this body and composed of that which is different with God dwelling in us forever to ensure that which is perfect be forever. That there will never be anything that happens again where anyone will choose something different because they're of one mind. They chose it, they wanted it, they embraced it, and God gave it, and he gave the power to have it. What an awesome thing to understand and to embrace. Why we're this way. And I don't like this. <laughs> That's the choice. I don't like selfishness. I hate it. I loathe it. I loathe. And I'm learning to loathe it more and more. I loathe drama. I truly do. Because it's the absolute opposite of peace, what God wants to give us. It's the opposite of true family. True family. We can have physical families, but it's not true family until we become part of the God family, Elohim. Then it's true and set forever. Beautiful. Things to be thankful for, to take away from the feast, to think about those kinds of things that were given to us, to realize that there's incredible wealth in what God is sharing with us, to understand why we're this way, why we had to be created this way. These are the things that excite me, that make me excited. I'm thankful for them. And the more thankful I am in that regard, the more I'm able to rejoice in it. It's, it's a spiritual thing. It's just there. What an awesome thing to have in life. Anyway. Verse 15, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returning with a loud voice, glorified God. He was rejoicing. He was so excited and thanking God for what he had. That's why he had that kind of response. The others, they were just selfish. What a horrible thing when people are just like a black hole and suck it all in and, and want to go out and have more and get more and have more in life and are never fulfilled. This individual at this point, he was fulfilled in a very powerful way. It truly was. Though he was very physical, a uh, Samaritan, as it says, and fell down on his face and his feet, giving him thanks. Even he was a Samaritan. So Joshua answered and said, were there not ten who were cleansed? So where are the other nine? It's kind of like the church since the time of Christ. 
many have been called, far more have been called than those who've been chosen out of all that, than those who have gone through the process. Far more have left, far more have turned against God and Christ, far more. So should it be a shock to us on something like this, that nine <laughs> went their way, weren't thankful to God at all, didn't show thanks to God at all? They were just on the getting in. They went out, they were just thankful now that they were made normal and could go out and do whatever they wanted to do. And I can guarantee you that wasn't good. It was all carnal and physical to them because now they're not repulsed by the public anymore. They're one of them. <laughs> Isn't that great? Anyway, <laughs> to be like everybody else. Anyway, uh, verse 18. There are not any found who have returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner. What an amazing thing. But one did, and we can learn from this. Because he was deeply thankful to God for what happened, because he knew what happened to him wasn't normal. People who are lepers, people who have various ailments, physical things, that, that healings that they heard about, people who were blind and could see, and they heard these stories. He was, he was acknowledging what was true. Only God can do such a thing. Only a God. Not that he knew much about it, or him, or what was taught, but he knew that this had to have come from God. And so he rejoiced. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. So there is a huge difference between being able to do things together, being able to have physical things together that we do as human beings and families and even a church, even through worldwide and on. And it's another thing to be able to do those things because God's in the picture, because you see God, what God is doing. And we thank, we're thankful for that. We're thankful for the process of all that we're experiencing and we glorify God then. Colossians 3 verse 12. Therefore, as the elect of God, those selected by God, those who are called. It's such a crazy thing. You know, I, when I was younger, I used to think, why not my brother? Why not someone else? You know, we see ourselves what we were like, what, if we know what we were like. And we acknowledge those things and we think, why not? Why? And we don't have a, we don't have a reason. We don't know. We do learn very quickly if we're hearing and listening. It's not because we were so good. <laughs> I didn't have to kid myself. So it endears us to God and to the truth that God's giving to us. Awesome. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy, that's what God says, set apart for holy use and purpose. So God draws us, He calls us, He begins opening up our mind to truth, and then we make choices whether we accept it, whether we embrace it, whether we want it. Those are big things because we're the only ones that can make the decision, this is what I want. Yes, we're given the ability to see it, first of all, to see something that the world can't see, that yes, there is a Seventh-day Sabbath, yes, Easter and Halloween and Christmas and all these things, we can see how wrong they are because, and it's up here. It's not because we figured it out, it's just because we, God gives us the ability to see how bad, how wrong they are, how deceitful they are. That's why it's blown my mind to know people have gone back to having a Christmas tree. You think, how could that happen? How could somebody do something like that? Go back to putting lights up and, and knowing what they knew, but all that can be lost. But in the beginning, it's there. Yeah, it's obvious. <laughs> Tree's wrong. You know, the giving of gifts and the reasons behind it and what they're doing it for. And he wasn't even born that time of year. We can learn those things. It's not rocket science. But to really see it, something that God has to give. And so we begin seeing those things and we begin seeing holy days, Passover. What an awesome thing to have Passover. What an incredible thing that something physical happened that led to something spiritual. 
and then coming out of getting rid of leaven, coming out of Egypt. And, and we begin to see those things, and that makes so much sense. And we see a plan then that we could never see before, and we know the world can't see it, but then later on reject it. It's because of choices we make. It's a horrible thing. So set apart for holy use and purpose to change, to be transformed up here. And you got to fight for it. And loved by God. And then as we begin to grow in that, then we begin to love one another more. We begin to see God in, in others and what God is doing in them. We should have been able to see that at the feast. Everyone should have the ability to have seen that in others. You're there because of what you believe. You're embracing it because of what you believe. You're going through what you're going through together because of what you believe and your conviction to change and do things better. It makes us a family of God. And loved. Put on. And this has to do with, it says tender mercies here, but that's not the right word. It's, it's about the inward parts, the heart of, in other words, what's deep inside of us. So it's something we have to think about. It's something we have to pray about. It's like hearing the sermons or the things included in sermons that have to do with David and realizing he was, he, <laughs> a man after God's own heart. And then we realize, this is what I, that's what I want. I want to be like that. I want to be a person who reflects a desire to draw closer to God, to, to please God, to honor God, to, to, draw, to have a relationship there where He is my Father. I think every, every human being growing up, whether they've ever known their Father or not, there's something inside where you want something People who are adopted, they want something that they don't, but never had it be. There's something there. And on and on it goes. Someone loses at a very young age or whatever and doesn't grow up then with a father or a mother. But in this case, they're talking about a father. There's that which is inside of us. It's just natural in the human mind that God has given in the spirit essence that's in us. But how much more then when we begin to see it on a spiritual plane, a relationship with someone who knows how to be a father forever. To have that closeness and that unity and that oneness and I, awesome. And loved, put on, again here, the inward heart of compassion. Compassion. And you have to have a mind of thankfulness to accomplish that. A mind toward others and how we live and how we think and the way God says to. And then we do that and we realize we're drawing closer to God in the process. And anyway, kindness. We understand what it's like for people to be kind. And so, we're to learn from that. We recognize that God is kind to us in incredible ways, and we want to be that way to, toward others. That's how to put on that right kind of a heart then, and a desire toward God, and a desire toward others, and so forth. Verse 13, forbearing with one another. So a lot of that boils down to, are we thankful for one another? Are we thankful? For, because the more we're thankful for one another, that God has called each person within the body, that we're able to have this body. It's not a matter of, of whether it be in the thousands or ten, but because you can't get to know that many. Well, I've been in large congregations, and you can't get to know everyone. It's difficult enough. At the feast, we're not able to spend much time with different ones. But there's this closeness that's a bonding that's a result of God's Spirit and we understand things in one another then. And then we do have the time to be in different groups. It's like trying to go out to a restaurant. You only get so many. And, and we're limited. There's only so much you can hear. And you have to be pretty close to do that, like right next to you, uh, especially if it's loud and whatever. And so you're able to have that bond or friendship and so forth. But again, it's, we learn to do these things. 
forbearing with one another. So that has to do with being patient. We don't change overnight. You know, it takes time. I'm working on many things. I was working on many things when I was called, bigger things. But as long as you're in God's church, you're going to be working on many things because selfishness permeates our life. It's out there, and it's a battle. It really is. Forbearing with one another. So we have to realize we have to be careful how we think toward one another and give people time. Give people that mind of even forgiveness, of forbearing, forgive, being forgiving towards others, not holding things against others, giving people the chance to change, giving people the chance to grow. It takes time. And they maybe have a bad day. Have you ever had a bad day? I have a lot of them. What I would call a bad day. <laughs> or bad parts of a day. And then you've got to get a hold of those things and work on those things. Life, life is work. It's a battle in this, a, in this world when you're striving to live God's way of life. A lot of obstacles, a lot of things come at us. And forgiving <laughs> follows it up, doesn't it? And forgiving one another. Because to forbear with someone, you have to be of that mind, a forgiving spirit, a forgiving attitude towards others. Because you see the bigger picture of what God is doing in your life and in everyone else's life. I love that word gracious. Since we went through that about mercy and we see the word gracious, when you think about what it means to be gracious to others, it includes these things, forbearing, patience, forgiving. It's a, it's a part of what it means to be gracious, but that stems from how you think in the sense of love and care to be gracious to others. God is that way to us so many times over. And we're to learn to do the same towards others because we love it. We love graciousness, what it means to be gracious. And if anyone has a, it says quarrel in some translations, but it basically means holds a fault against another. Why do that? Hopefully they're going to, if it's, long lasting and it goes on year after year, hopefully you come to, they come to a point where they're able to acknowledge certain things or see certain things in themselves and, and make that leap in growth. I saw some of that this year. I, I feel like I've heard about some of that this year where if you look at last year and then you look at this year, that there are individuals who have made a leap in some of those things. Perfect? Absolutely not. None of us are, but have, are making progress and growth. And to me, there's nothing more rewarding in the body of Christ than to see growth, the ability to produce fruit. We should want to see that in one another. And if anyone has a, holds a fault against another, even as Christ forgave you, you should do the same. And, and so much of this goes back to this matter of being thankful. If we're thankful for one another, if we're thankful for the calling that God has given to each individual, but above all things, put on agape, God's love, which binds together in perfection. So that's, that's the ultimate of it all. And it all leads to that. All these traits, all these qualities of being able to do these things in relationships and friendships is a matter of growing in God's spirit, which is a matter of growing in God's love up here, of something that God is helping to the mind to transform to into more of His love. But it has to be fueled by His Holy Spirit, so we have to cry out to God for the help to strengthen that and to strengthen those convictions that He's blessing us with in the mind as the mind is changing because it takes the fuel, if you will, the power of God's Spirit to make those things alive in a, in a more meaningful way. So we, always have, we have to cry out to God every day for help. I need your spirit. I, can, I know I cannot do this and be on guard about various things without your help. 
And then it might be an hour later and I've already flubbed up, you know. Just put me on the highway and you find that out. It's up here. That's why I want to get a Tesla truck. <laughs> Larry had one at the feast and I'll probably have more to say about that later on because I think, what an incredible vehicle. It, I know it's the safest vehicle on the highway. And it kind of irks me to know of mankind and the selfishness of mankind. Human beings can do these things, especially if they'll share. And share, that's what the millennium, share technology. We have, we don't even, we're not even scratching the surface yet of what's going to be done over that thousand years when people cooperate, when companies, if they're like that, whatever they're, how they're organized, are able to do such things in a cooperative manner, sharing. Because I think of 45 to 50,000 people that get killed every year in car wrecks alone in this country. Do you know most of that could be avoided if, if people had been practicing for the last 20 years what one individual of an owner is doing with the one vehicle? Seriously, there would not be the death tolls that we have today. That thing's like being in a cocoon of protection. Well, I would. Anyway. <laughs> and I also have to say that when I was in that, I just have to, I have to share this with you. When it was driving down the road on its own, you just put the address in, right? Put the address in. I didn't think about it until I got back that I was so at peace. It was a, a mode called, was it Calm? What was the name of the? Uh, are you talking about ch uh, oh, Chill? Chill. chill. <laughs> there are different programs you can put on there. One is the chill factor. <laughs> you push chill. And I was chilled. I was calm. I wasn't, if, if, if I'm in a vehicle, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot help myself. That's why my wife hates to drive when I'm in the vehicle, is that I'm looking around all the time. I'm looking in the mirrors and, and this thing of how, how are things going around us and so forth. And so if I'm with someone and I'm not driving, I'm not in control, which is probably a good thing. Uh, it's like, I can't help myself. It's just in my nature. So I have to fight this. But when I was riding in that vehicle, I got back and I thought, I have never been on a ride where I've been so at peace in all my life. That might sound crazy, but I, I, that's, that's the truth. When I got back, I thought, this is awesome. I gotta have, no. <laughs> Everybody should have, uh, and it, so you think about the millennium, and you think about when people do things for the right reasons, safety, protection. What are we really going to be able to accomplish? We're, we're just at the beginning stages of some of this, truly of things that are going to be able to be changed. And a lot of it's through things that are in God's creation that we just haven't learned to harness or work with yet. And one day when we have all that, oh, amazing. That's why I think of the people who are resurrected in the 144,000 and they see these highways and they see these vehicles and they see these jets and they see all these things and they're going to be a little dumbfounded. Well, you take another thousand years, it's going to make that... 6,000 year span look pretty puny. It really is. Anyway, sorry I got a little sidetracked there, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> Verse 15. Even let the peace of God rule in your hearts. That's, that says a lot there. That's really a sermon. What do you mean, rule? Well, that's what we need to think about. Rule in your heart. It's a choice. So we want that to be what rules our thinking in our life. We want to yield ourselves to that, to what it means to have peace toward one another in the body, always, always. To have that mind of God, it comes from God. Peace comes from God. That's what he's creating. And that can be, that's in us being created. Beautiful. Let it rule in your hearts. In the, in the innermost part of your being, to which you were called in one body. So I was called into the body, one body, and everyone else. 
who is of this mind, who is, has the impregnation of God's Spirit, the begettle of God's Spirit, to the same thing, and to be thankful for them, every one of them. And be thankful, because this is the overriding thing. Always, 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 and understanding what God is doing. Always being thankful, because that's what stirs up the ability to rejoice on a spiritual plane with the life we have that, that makes it fulfilling. You think about the world and the things they, try, they go to try to do various things to, to enjoy life, and those things are still lacking when it's something is over that they've experienced. But I think at the feast, it's not over in the sense of what we experienced. We are able to take it with us. The things we did, the th experiences we had together, the closeness of what we see in the body, and it's, it's a realization this is the body of Christ. This is the church of God, and it's getting better and better and better. Beautiful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing. It's not one another. We've been through this in the past. It's not translated well. It's about ourselves. It's about what we're doing. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing yourselves. We have to receive the teaching and the admonitions that God gives to us by our own choices. It's not a matter of going out here and trying to get others to change and do certain things the way we think they should be doing them. It's, it's working on this pile of flesh. In psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is something that is so easily taken in a Protestant manner. The world does because they can't help it. Protestant. And it's not real. And this isn't something physical. It's spiritual. I've mentioned this in times past, but we receive a little bit at a time in that regard that in something like this teaching and admonishing yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing. It's the rejoicing in here in God. It's a spiritual thing. It's not the physical things that you have to go sing a song. I think I probably ought to go sing a psalm now. You know, <laughs> you know there are times when we can do that and whatever we think of one every once in a while, I think that some song comes to the mind of things we sing or hear in services. And, but, but this is something that you live. It's something that's inside of you. It's in your being, which is about this matter of rejoicing on a spiritual plane in God, in what He gives. It's the fullness inside. That's why these expressions are here. Because if we can understand them on a physical plane, we're singing to God, we're thankful to God, it's about God, it's about what God is doing, on and on it goes, and yet this is what lives inside of us that we're able to respond to. And the more thankful we are for those things, the more fulfilling that can become inside of us. Singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's about God. It's about how we are inside, and it's a matter of God being in the picture all the time. He makes it possible. Indeed, whatever you do in word or deed, in other words, in speaking or action in your life, do all, it's, it's through, the name of our Lord Joshua. In other words, it requires, help. we have to have help. We need God's Spirit constantly, and that should be at the forefront. These are things we can experience and have, but it's accomplished through the power of God's Spirit. Giving thanks, see, it's always about thanks to God. It's about this mindset of something we're able to experience and live, because of thankfulness, gratitude that's inside. Of who makes it possible? Just like that leper. Think about what we were. Think about what you were when you were first called. Or you made that decision, you came to that point in your life, and changes begin to take place because of your decisions, because of your choices. We have to be able to remember what we were. You know, that's why this concept or this truth about healing is so important. We can look at a physical lep leper and the fact that they're healed physically, but we're being healed. 
we have to be healed up here. This has to be healed. And that's a marvel above and beyond things that are physical of healing. This is spiritual. It's of the mind. It's of the thinking. It's about a relationship with God. Beautiful. Through the name of our Lord Joshua, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, yes, there's thanks, but there's this matter of relying and crying out to God for the power of his spirit to live in us. Let's turn over to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. I want to look at another example similar to the one in Luke 17 that we looked at about the leper. So here's another example of something on a physical plane that we can learn something more deeply on a spiritual plane. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. So here is the time now. Christ had been with the disciples for 40 days, and then he told them to wait for the Holy Spirit, in essence, on the, for the day of Pentecost, and that's when those, all these things come together. And so now it starts in verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple in the hour of prayer in the ninth hour, so 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms. In other words, to ask for an offering or a handout of, of money, whatever. Uh, from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. Then looking upon him with John, Peter said, look at us. So here he is asking, but now he makes the contact and says, in essence, to look upon us, listen, or whatever it is that's said here that takes place in this expression because it's kind of an awkward expression in how it's used here. But basically, it's making this eye, eye contact. So it says he gave them attention, expecting to receive something from them. So because of how he responded, it wasn't just somebody that was going to walk on by. Because we've seen people in different places at times where someone may be asking for something, and, and sometimes you don't know whether it's real or not. And most of the times, frankly, in this world, it isn't of something that someone truly needs. Um, anyway, long story. Verse 6. Then Peter said, I do not have silver and gold, but what I have I will give to you. What an awesome thing to know this is what God was giving him at that moment in time because God had to make it very clear up here this is what he was to do. God Almighty, through the power of his spirit, in essence speaking to him, communicating to his mind, this is what you do. It was automatic, quickly. In the name of Joshua the Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Awesome. Then he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So as he's working to lift him up, to give him a hand, right away, that power of God's healing in his body starting to take place. So jumping up, he stood and walked and entered into the temple with them, walking, jumping, and praising God. So, awesome. You think of something like that happening? Someone who's been like this and all of a sudden is gone? This is what, you know, had to, didn't have an ability to go out and work and do various things, but for ability to live and so forth, depended upon the ability to receive that help. And there wasn't a system set up to accomplish this, so that's why he was there. And, and people recognized him because he was always there, so some would help him at different times. And anyway, uh, verse 9, it says, So all the people saw him walking and praising God. He, he was rejoicing inside. He was thanking God, praising God for what had taken place. I mean... Wouldn't you think that should be a response that people should have? Just like with those lepers, you'd think that would be, should be the response, but it's not always with human beings. But in this case here, he did the right thing, obviously. Then they knew that he was the one who sat begging for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So it gave Peter the opportunity then to begin teaching some other things. But what an incredible experience. But again here, the response. 
from something so dramatic in his life, it's something would, was easier to do in one respect if you realize that this is unique in how it's coming to you. He goes into the temple. He's thanking, he's thanking God. He can't help it. It's just he is so excited. Now, we're learning this, but on a spiritual plane. Feast by feast, Sabbath by Sabbath, year by year, as we're growing. It's about this body. It's about the body of Christ. It's about the family, the church of God. We are family in a unique way from God Almighty, with God Almighty, and His son Joshua. That in itself, to understand those things and comprehend those things should move us so deeply inside a thankfulness, a gratefulness. And if we see that, then it's more toward one another and it's toward God, more genuinely so. Incredible what God gives to us. So he was made whole, he was thankful, and that's what resulted in the actions that he took in praising God. So I'm not going to go into some of the scriptures today, but remember this part here. He was praising God. Sometimes, and that comes out, and it's a, th it's a thankfulness. It's a rejoicing inside for what took place. So sometimes when we see those expressions, especially in the Psalms, about praising God, it's not, not necessarily in a song, which some, the Psalms as a whole were, written by most of them by David. But they were always a matter of thank it's a thank thankfulness to God, thanking God. And in whatever way we do that, whether it be by prayer or by our response to various things that take place, but it's something inside that has to do with thankfulness that creates a rejoicing and an excitement of life and enjoyment of life that's rich. So just a, another form here of rejoicing before and in God Almighty. I want to stop there before we go on to the next one. Let's, let's take one Psalm, Psalm 28, just to drive the point home, well, part of it. Psalm 28, verse 1. Psalm 28, verse 1. To you I will cry, O eternal, my rock. So there are prayers we have in life. There are things we experience in life. And these and things like this are truly beautiful in what they produce and create inside as we yield to them. To you I will cry, O eternal, my rock. So it's crying out to the self-existing one of eternity the eternal God, and He is our rock, first and foremost. Do not be silent to me. In other words, it's a desire and a cry to listen, to hear, and to respond to my petition. Something I, I find at times in life, you can pray about some of the smallest of things, physical things. And maybe the weather, like for the feast. And it dropped like 20 degrees at one time from what it had been. And then you know that God heard a petition. And then toward the end, started coming back again. Those things are exciting. I don't care what it is in your life you pray about. But if you see there's something that happens in life on a regular basis when we pray about them, and you realize God he wants us to have this relationship with Him. And there are things He does want to do with us. They might be, they might be small and different things in life, too. You can pray about the little things or big things. It doesn't matter. Sometimes God doesn't respond in that regard because there's something we need to learn. But so often, He does. And those are the things we need to truly respond back to God in and thank Him for. <laughs> because a lot of times, we don't as human beings. To you I will cry, O eternal my God, do not be silent to me. Otherwise, if you are silent to me, I'll become like those who go down to the pit. In other words, here's a genuine desire toward God saying, I need you. I need help. And if I don't receive this help from you, just like when we cry out for God's spirit, if I don't receive it, I won't, I won't be able to accomplish what you've called me to do. In this case here, he's saying something that Without you, this, I'll be like every other human being out here. 
but I want you. I want your life. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to you, when I lift up my hands toward you or uh, toward your holy sanctuary. So again here, this attitude of mind of crying out to God or praying to God or recognizing we need God's help. Then dropping down to verse 6 as an example here, it goes on to say, Blessed be the eternal, because he has heard the voice of my supplications. So what does it mean, blessed be the eternal? It's, it's a form of recognizing this comes from God. This has come from God. It's a matter of thankfulness. It's not a matter that we pass some blessing along to God. It's how we think toward God. It's what we see that God is doing in our lives, what God's plan and purpose is accomplishing, and how it able, is able to lift our lives up and strengthen us. So indeed, what a blessing to have God. What a, what a thing of thankfulness to have God in our life and that he's heard because he has heard my, the voice of my supplication. The eternal is my strength and my shield. I think of when we went through the apostasy. You think of various things that happened and became so clear very early on. We don't have a chance. We have absolutely nothing in understanding how this has happened and what's taken place and what we're living through, except you give it to us to see and to know and to understand. How can we know? How can we know at, at all, anything? And God begin, begins to help us in our lives to understand something like an apostasy, what took place, how it took place, and so forth. Beautiful, incredible to see God's answer. Because the reality is, at that time, or any time in our life, unless God gives us the guidance and the direction and the help to see things that we need to see on a spiritual plane, we're with, we have no power, we have no ability. What good is human knowledge without God at the forefront leading and guiding and directing us through it? Anyway. Blessed be the eternal, because he has heard the voice of my supplication. The eternal is my strength and my shield. Do we realize that when we go off in the mornings, when we go off to work? God is our shield. It's by his strength. It's by his protection. We need that help in our life. I think of an example sometimes I use in prayers, like for God's people. <laughs> Help us with that orb of protection. That means all around us. It's like being in that great big round rubber ball that we're, you can roll down a hill in, except this one's a bigger one. They have some that you can be totally inside of. But in this case here, it's a matter of we want protection <laughs> from the outside, whatever it might be. We need your help to have such protection in this world and to thank God that he grants us those kinds of things. You know, there are so many things that God intervenes in our lives. We, don't, we have no idea how often, how much, so when things, and you see certain things, the blessings we have in our life, understand as a whole in life, indeed it's because of God and what God gives to us. The more you recognize that, well, the more you rejoice inside. <laughs> because God does make a difference with us, brethren. Doesn't mean we don't have to go through some difficult things at times, but that's what we learn from. That's what we learn through. God will use those to help mold and fashion us. But through all that, we have incredible favor, intervention, and protection of an angelic realm sometimes that we have no comprehension how many times they've intervened. Truly. I think of how, well, so often, various accidents that happen on a freeway or whatever, and if I hadn't have done this or this hadn't happened in just a, a minute, half a minute, whatever it might have been, that things can happen in our lives, could have happened in our lives, and was... Was God there protecting? So often, exactly so. So often, exactly so. Blessed be the eternal, because he's heard the voice of my supplication. The eternal is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. So this is something we learn. We trust in God. God's there to help us. And when we're going through something that's hard, you know what? God is there to help us through it, whatever it might be, even in that, because there's that which we're to learn through it. 
Therefore, my heart greatly rejoices. Why? How? Because of the gratitude, the thankfulness, the ability to see this is God. And this is God's care for us. My heart greatly rejoices. And with my song, I will praise him. So even in that, it's a matter of thankfulness, gratitude to God Almighty, always.